Good afternoon. I'm Samuel Haynes from the Behavioral Insights team, and thank you for joining us for Choice and Authenticity. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our interviewer, Hannah Rosen. Hannah co-hosts the NPR podcast, Invisibilia. If you're a behavioral science enthusiast, which I'm sure many of you are, uh, you should definitely subscribe, um, as many of us at the Behavioral Insights team do. Uh, she's also the author of The End of Men, available on level three for sale today. And in it, she argues that the patriarchy is coming to an end. <laughs> Hana will be interviewing Professor Sheena Ayenga. Sheena is one of the world's leading experts on choice and how we all find it difficult to make good decisions in a world with so many options to choose from. She's now working on how we experience authenticity in a technological world and an uncertain one too. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Welcome especially to the men, now that I'm outed for who I <laughs> truly am. Um, I, uh, I want to say before I start that uh, I love Sheena's book. Um, since we're all very high-minded, I'll start on a personal note. The book came in a moment when I had to make a, a, a very big difficult choice in my life, and so I, I read it like a Bible. I'm not going to tell you what that choice is, but um, uh, maybe later, privately. But anyway, <laughs> um, but I do love this book. The message of it is, is a little bit, it's is, is kind of um, difficult to take in, which is the choice is absolutely critical, that we have to feel like we own our choices, and yet we are not great at making them, or rather that a lot of things get in the way. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how, what gets in the way of our making good choices, and then how we can do that better. That's the basic rundown. Um, maybe we'll just start by pinning this idea that choice is critical. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways that Sheena proves this in the book, but can we just, um, why is choice critical? Why wouldn't I just outsource my choices to you or people smarter than me, generally? Hi, everybody. <laughs> So I am Sheena. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you guys for, actually, you guys just made a choice to come to this session. So thank you for making that choice. Um, I think there's lots of reasons why choice is so critical. I think at, at birth, we are all innately born with a desire to have control. We're actually not born with a desire to have choice, per se. But we are all born with a desire to have innate control over our environment. Even a baby doesn't want to be locked up, nor does an animal. Um, however, everything else about choice, how we make choices, what we think are good or bad choices, how many choices should we have, which choices are meaningful or meaningless, all of that we are taught by our culture and our social environments. And so it really is what determines what we do, what we think, and ultimately, collectively, what kind of a society we form. So um, you just named one of the things that we are not fully aware of when making choices is how our culture influences our choices. Um, that's something that Sheena talks about in the book, sort of if, you know, there, there are certain studies showing that American perception of choice is very different than, say, a Chinese child's uh, perception of choice. So that's one. Um, maybe we'll talk about some of the others. So what are biases that we are not aware of that get in the way of us making choices? Like framing choices is one that you talked about, how we frame choices. That's a great question. So you know, whether it be culture or framing, I can actually talk about both. Uh, particularly given what's happening here in terms of Brexit and even in the US. I actually can't decide which country is slightly more uncertain. <laughs> uncertain, that's a nice word, uncertain. I'm, 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 trying, to be, I'm trying to be PC here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she just made reference to a study that I did way back in the 1990s. It was actually my first study on choice, um, where I looked at Chinese and and Anglo-American children. And what, what, it, what we found was that if you tell an American child that you can choose your activity, or you tell that American child that your mother chose it for you versus a Chinese kid, it turned out that the Chinese children did better when they were told that their mother made the choice, better meaning they performed better, they were more motivated to do well in school, 
versus when they got to choose. Now, Americans were so angry that you could dare ask their mother, how dare you? Um, verse, and so they did worse for mom versus when they got to choose. Now, let's think about that. At some level, we think, we agree with one or the other of those paradigms because it feels like a universal truth. So the Western notion would be, if a choice affects me, then I should be the one that makes it because I'm the one who knows best what determines my happiness, my success. We consider that to be an innate truth. In many Asian cultures, on the other hand, here's another equally valid innate truth. If a choice is really, really important, then obviously it's the respected elder or the respected other that should be the one who has the larger input in making that decision. Now, if you think about it in today's world, those, whether it's those contrasting narratives or other contrasting narratives that either divide nations or divide people within nations, it really boils down to what narrative are we telling about cause and effect? And to, we could call that culture, particularly when we're talking about the ways in which different countries differ from one another, or we could talk about it as framing. I mean, for example, take a, an example that's happening just right down the street here. Why is the argument framed as Brexit or no Brexit? Why is it always yes or no? And I can think of hundreds of political debates or public policy debates that are often framed as yes or no. And in fact, if you're a good chooser, you'll avoid the yes or no trap because usually that boxes you into something which you're probably not going to like. Do you want to give the Coke or Pepsi example which you give in your book? It's a good illustration of this, sort of how somebody critically changed the framing around Coke or Pepsi, and that led to a completely different, like a, a different kind of success. Which one are you talking about? Is the one about, about the one, the many MRI drinks study? versus, it was the sort of many drinks versus, it was just the, it's, it's a good business. Oh, you're talking about good, the, oh, yeah. okay. So when I was um, doing research on, I spent the first part of my career studying choice where I was really going around the world looking at the way people thought about choice in different parts of the globe. And one of the things that, I, that struck me was when I was in Moscow, I was in the midst of, and this was in the late 90s. So it was in the late 90s. I was in Moscow, and I was just doing you know, these focus group discussions around choice. And I was asking them all these difficult choices about moral choices and the importance of feeling autonomous. You know, I was really trying to get way up there, abstract. And in order to sort of make people feel comfortable in these focus group discussions, I would have a selection of sodas available, like Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, Mountain Dew, et cetera. And I remember very clearly this one guy, he was like this pretty important business guy, and he just said, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all just one choice. He was referring to my selection of drinks. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean, what, what do you mean one choice? I, 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 as far as, you know, there's Mountain Dew, and I tried to explain to him the difference between Mountain Dew and Coke and thinking that he clearly just didn't understand. And it turned out they knew all the jingles associated with all of the soda pops even better than I did. And yet the question was, well, so what? These are not meaningful choices. And one of the things that I found after that is I started to systematically present the same selection of sodas all around Eastern Europe. And this is, again, just shortly after the collapse of the communist era. Um, and uh, again and again, people from the Eastern European countries would say uh, that this was one choice or no choice. These didn't constitute as meaningful choices. And, and it wasn't that they were saying they didn't want choice. They were saying this does not constitute a meaningful choice. Now, as an American, we, are, we spend our entire lives training to spot the difference so that, you know, even though we are actually told by scientists that we can't tell Coke and Pepsi apart, we would swear that we know the difference and that we're unique in knowing that difference and we know which one is better. And by the way, Coke is better. 
Um, uh, uh, another thing that you talk about is um, how about evidence we ignore? That was a big one, like evidence we ignore, say, in hiring. Sort of, this, it, it's, it's, it's part of the larger picture of when we're making a choice, we're so interested in narrative coherence that we do a lot in order to preserve narrative coherence, um, which we're not that aware that we're doing. Um, so I think it was your book that talked about hiring, sort of how we tell stories about which candidate we're going to choose and why we're choosing that candidate. So. I have a question for you guys. Um, if I were to, if you had to make a really important decision, right? I, you want to you have a job with a startup that's really really cool and it might save the world, but you might you also might end up getting stuck being homeless, um, <laughs> or you could go work for BlackRock, right? Make a ton of money and be very relatively secure, given that they. The amount of money they have is more than several GDPs. Okay. How would you make the choice? How many here would use your, your heart? Raise your hands. What would you say? OK, do it again. Raise your hands again. <laughs> it's not quite half. Okay. And how many of you would say you would use your mind? Well, less than. Heart. Maybe they thought the choice was going to be heart or money. Okay. <laughs> Let's do that again. How many here, now that you know the choice is heart, raise your hands. My, and, and then mind. That worked out about half and half, I would say. That, by the way, is the norm. I've been doing that for years. No matter how large the room, how small the room, it's always split down the middle, right? Now, let's imagine you do make this choice. What is the average person going to do? If you use your heart, what method are you going to use? Just anybody, just uh, you know, I guess raise your hand and tell me, what would you use? What does heart mean? What are you, how are you going to make that choice? Values. Values. Your values. OK, good. Anybody else say something about how you're going to use your heart? Instinct. Instinct, what feels good, right? Okay. Now, what about if you were using your mind? Then what are you going to use? How are you going to do that? Pros and cons, Pros and cons of really lovely spreadsheet. I once had a student that literally came to me. who was this like 40-year-old executive MBA student. And he came to me, and he had this really detailed spreadsheet because he couldn't decide whether he wanted to marry this person whom he had nicknamed Passion or this person he had nicknamed Safe. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, I can't figure it out. I keep adding, and I, I please help me decide. <laughs> OK, so what goes wrong with that method? Both methods, what goes wrong? So we've got no right answer, mm -hmm. selective evidence. Mm -hmm. Can't split the two. It's a and false choice. Have you ever had this experience where you make the decision, right? Or you've, you've gone through the process. You know you should go to the job at BlackRock, right? And at that last moment, or you know you shouldn't, you know, break up with X or stay with X or marry X, et cetera. Somehow, when the time comes, no matter how reasonable that solution is, you don't choose it. You just don't, even, even if someone says, look, what are you, out of your mind? And that's because heart alone, mind alone isn't enough, and heart alone isn't enough. There's a reason why those two work in synergy. There's a reason why right and left brains are not actually separated out in the, in the way that we, that those are all folklores. So in a sense, we do the same thing when we're, no matter what decision we make, we either go with one or the other, in which case we're biased in, the, in both directions, or we are conflicted, in which case, because we, we kind of know we should do this, but we kind of don't want to. So we want to do the opposite, but then we look like an idiot, and we don't want to look like an idiot. In truth, what you should do is find that alignment between heart and mind. 
Even if you look back at the very person who gave us the pros and cons list was a guy named Benjamin Franklin, who's kind of famous in the United States. <laughs> and Benjamin Franklin was sent a letter by a man by the name of Joseph Priestley. How many people here know who Joseph Priestley was? Raise your hands. He was a Britisher. We got about eight. OK, good. I'm, pr I'm proud of you. So um, Joseph Priestley had a very difficult decision to make, kind of similar to the one I just kind of gave you. He was, he was living in the countryside. He was a reverend. He had eight kids. He needed more money. There was a lord that offered him a position here in London to tutor his kids to make extra money. But that meant he had to stay away from his eight kids, and he could no longer do his little scientific experiments on the side, which he didn't want to lose. So he writes to Benjamin Franklin, and he asks Benjamin Franklin, what should I choose? And Benjamin Franklin famously says, I cannot tell you what to choose, but I can tell you how to choose. And he tells them to make, take a piece of paper, break it up into the pros and cons lists, divide it up in half over time, come up with your pros, come up with your cons, where two pros equal one con, or three cons equal one pro, yeah, do all the Xing out, see where the weight lies, and there you have your choice. Very rational, right? By the way, Joseph Priestley never followed his advice. <laughs> Joseph Priestley didn't like what he got. He didn't want to leave his family, but he needed the money. So what did he do? He got out of what I call the yes or no trap, this or that. Instead, what he did was he came up with the third option. And the third option was that he decided to find one of his protégés who ended up working, doing the job of tutoring the kids in London. He would come to London periodically, every fortnight, to mentor the tutor. So he got some money for that. But he spent most of his time over there in the countryside with his kids. And he did his scientific experiments and created seltzer water. <laughs> And so what's my point? My point is that we often go with just our gut, which leads to a whole host of biases. Even when we use reasoned analyses, we often end up either not wanting to choose what, may, what is rational or seemingly reasonable, or we, that process unto itself is biased. Really what you're looking for is a decision where there's alignment between what your heart and your mind want. If you have alignment, choose it. Even if it goes badly, you'll be invested in figuring out all the choices that come afterwards to make it work. But what, is like, what does that mean, alignment? How do you know? When, so take passion and safe. Yes. How do, what does alignment look like in that situation? <laughs> So can you find alignment between passion and safe? What do you guys think? How many people say, yes, you should choose one of those. Just clap your hands so I can hear your passion. <laughs> OK? So what do you actually do? In, so I guess you all know. I would, I would delay. You clearly haven't found your third choice of alignment. Interesting. OK. That means neither choice is actually working for you. Um, in terms of the hiring example that she was mentioning, alluding to earlier, we do have this tendency to engage in confirmation bias, which is that it has been seen repeatedly that you pretty much decide if you, you know, want to have sex with somebody or want to hire them is within the first one minute, plus or minus 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and so therefore what? I mean, the point of all these things, like when you were giving the study of when you were talking about you know, the Asian children choose this way, the American children choose this way, the point is just to be aware of all these things, right? It's not to say that one method necessarily is better than the other method. Or like when you say, so you, you pretty know, much know within 30 seconds. So then what do we do with that information? Knowing that we pretty much know, knowing that you know, my, what my mind does is instantly decide I guess what you're saying is that my mind, let's say I'm faced with 10 candidates, my mind instantly settles on one, probably for shallow reasons, because the person is like me or reminds me of me or something like that. Then I should just be aware of that and counter it. Is that the idea? So I think being aware is a noble goal. 
And you should definitely try to be aware if it's something really important. But I, I think for the most part, we should just assume we're biased. And what you want to be conscious of is when something really, really matters to you. Because when something really, really matters to you, then you want to very consciously ask yourself, what are your goals? Like, what is it that you're really trying to achieve here? And, and what are those deep desires that maybe you're too embarrassed or ashamed of saying out loud, but are actually going to be very important in your final decision? And, and so just accept and own your biases so that at least whatever decision you make, you're aware of what could go right or wrong. And because it's aligned with the two parts of you, you'll be more committed to trying to make it work, because that's essentially all any of us can ever do. Um, I'm going to try and I want to talk a lot about choice and options, but not yet. Let me just try for one more, um, one more in the category of kind of biases that we're not totally aware of. But this is a little hard to articulate, so you'll be better at it. It was very revelatory for me in reading your book. This idea that when we're making choices, uh, particularly personal choices, we have this idea that we are going to find our authentic self, that the goal of the choice is that to find, the, this is a very American idea, uh, the goal of the choice is to find the true me, and if I just make the correct choice, like the correct job, the correct partner, the correct outfit, then the true me will be revealed, and that there's an answer there, and I have to make the right choice to find the answer that that way of thinking about decisions. How many of you here believe that you have a true self? Clap your hands. Okay. How many of you believe that the true self is actually an illusion? So this notion that we have a true self, I mean, obviously, philosophers, scientists, et cetera, have been debating about that forever. I don't think we'll ever prove that you do or do not. If anything, I think it's, it's mixed. We're, we're all a mixture of nature and nurture. And you are essentially, I think uh, Camus had it right, you are essentially the sum of your choices by, by the time we're, you're gone. But some of us do hold this belief system that we have a true self, right? And that part of our job in life is to go find, go discover it. Whereas others believe that we have to somehow create it through a variety of different types of experiments that we engage in, which will ultimately add up to who we are. Regardless of what belief system you have, what we find when we do studies is if I ask you after the, if I ask you at any one point, you can even think about this right now, when was the last time that you felt really, really authentic? And if you were to jot that down right now, Guarantee you that most of you in this room will have thought of an occasion where you just weren't thinking about yourself. The self wasn't even present. You were just in the zone. You know, maybe you were doing something like something that, that you're passionate about, some kind of work, some kind of artistic endeavor, maybe some kind of exercise. So you were either engaging in an act of core competency or you had just forgotten yourself because you were so busy engaging in an activity. And it's usually an activity where you're connecting with another. And so you, you, actually, the self is absent at that moment when you were feeling most authentic. So here's the problem. You are trying to make choices about your present and your future that will enable you to feel authentic, because there's no such thing as right or wrong. So it's hard to measure right or wrong. It's hard to measure better or worse. You're really trying to find that fit. And so authenticity becomes that criteria. And yet you never really know whether you've achieved that criteria, because you're really only going to know if you were authentic after the fact. Because it's not like you're walking around thinking, oh, I'm feeling really authentic right now. <laughs> you might actually walk around and say, I'm feeling really fake. And so the extent that we're aware of authenticity in any given moment, it's that we're aware of the opposite. 
We know when we're feeling socially awkward or we're deliberately keeping a secret or, or faking it. And, and, and that does cause us a lot of stress. And did I answer your question? Yeah, although I wanted you to get all the way to the point that I got to just to confirm my own narrative that I've said in my head about your book, which is that it's actually, um, it's actually, I found it so liberating to think of choice not in that way, because it's very stressful to think if I make the wrong choice, then I will have betrayed my authentic self somehow and everything will be lost. Whereas if I, if I think more of choice as kind of an invention of myself or something, that in the process of choosing, I am actually creating some kind of authentic self, then choice becomes a kind of inventive process and not kind of, uh, you could get this really wrong and you will be screwed. So that was, my, that was my thinking, is that choice, like you're inventing something in the act of choosing. You're not, it's not as definitive. You can't go quite as wrong. So here's my belief right now on how <laughs> yeah. we think of the self in terms of choice. Choice is an act of invention. It is something you are constantly constructing. But I think that today, you can choose almost everything about yourself from morning until night. And you can make public almost every aspect of yourself, right? So I can, I can literally choose what I eat, what I wear, what I think, what I tweet, what I, you know, so essentially every single free associated thought is now a choice that can get attached to me. Now, if you, if any of us were to even just take 20 minutes and to jot down every single idea we have in the moment we're having it, and then read it to ourselves, forget about reading it to somebody else, read it as ourselves, so that we now have the perspective of actor and observer, it would be nonsensical, even to ourselves. So that one of the big, um, I would say almost obligations that we all have to ourselves today is in actually thinking about what aspects of me are really important to choose. Because in the old days, you didn't have to do that. Most of your life was prescripted already by the small town in which you grew up, your parents, whatever demographics you were a part of. Today, everything gets chosen by you, which now means that you do have to very consciously say, OK, I care about this, 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 and this. And these are the things that I want to be defined by, both by me and by others. And that's something that both will put a little bit of pressure on you in terms of trying to decide what's important to you, but also take some pressure off. Because, you know, look, what soda pop you drink is probably, on average, not that important. You can let that choice go. So you have this phrase in the book, the citizens of choice land. And I think that's what you're starting to get at now. We do live in a world, and some of us, in a culture in which the value and the perception is of infinite choice, just that at any given moment we want to have lots of choice and that's a thing we want to preserve. So maybe this is a moment to introduce your famous jam study and just tell people what is the jam study and what does it, what, what, you know, and then we'll launch a discussion about that, options. So back in the 90s, in those days, having a store like Drager's, which was located in Menlo Park, California, was actually unique. Today, it's actually becoming more and more commonplace. But this was a grocery store that offered over 250 different types of mustards, vinegars, mayonnaises, over 100 different types of just extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> and, and their jam aisle had 348 different types of jam. And so we did a study. Uh, and it was my, it was as I was coming out of studying culture, I started to, started to study, I guess, jam. I somehow got known for jam. I, I wasn't planning on it that way. Um, and that was one of those acts of randomness that uh, Bob Schiller referred to earlier. So um, anyway, I was talking to the store manager, and I asked him whether this model of offering people all this choice was really working. And at that time, they had 348 different types of jam. 
Jam seemed like a benign product that you know nobody hated, nobody was an expert on, so it seemed like a good enough product. I picked the Queen of England's brand of jam, Wil Wilkin and Sons, because it had the most varieties. And so we set up a little tasting booth right near the entrance of the store where we either put out six different flavors of jam or 24 different flavors of jam. And we looked at two things. First, in which case were people more likely to stop and sample some jam? And second, in which case were people more likely to buy a jar of jam? And it turned out that more people stopped when there were 24 on display, 60%, than when there were six on display, 40%. And, and those are two different populations. Now, when it came down to buying behavior, though, we saw the opposite effect. Whereas of the people who stopped when they were 24 on display, only 3% of them bought a jar of jam. Whereas of the people who stopped when they were six on display, 30% of them bought a jar of jam. So people who were at least 10 times more likely to make a choice when they saw less than when they saw more. Now, a lot of times people say that I'm the first person to say that more choice is bad. But if you pay attention to the results I just gave you, it's a little more nuanced than that. What I was really documenting here is that we're attracted to a larger set of options. But when it comes down to making a choice, we're more likely to make a choice when we see less than when we see more. The ramifications of that is that we do, we, we want to perceive ourselves as having choice, but when it comes down to making a choice, we don't want the exercise of choosing to be too burdensome. I'm just thinking about dating sites. Like, should you shield every third page? Like, you should look at all the pages, but, you know, blank out I, every... I can actually... I, I could do a whole hour just on online dating tips. Yes. I've actually done a number of studies on this. I feel like you can make a lot of money that way, just online dating <laughs> tips and options. Yeah. No, it's a very profound idea because we do... Um, I mean, there, there are, I don't know which examples I want to go to first, the, the medical ones or the dating ones. I mean, there are so many interesting ones. So tell me your first, so, so, you're, so, you, so essentially where your mind went after the JAM study is the importance of options and how we perceive options and what we do with them. Yes. Is that right? Yes, I, I would agree with that, sure. So, how, so, 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 so what is the process of creating options that are reasonable, meaningful, whatever word you want to use? It seems like that is a critical part of good decision making. Ah, OK. She's now asking me the really hard ones. Um, by the way, on dating, um, <laughs> how, how many of you here have done online dating? At, just clap your hands. Okay. Oh, that's not as much. What are you, most of you married or something? <laughs> okay. It's the age of the crowd. Ah, uh, all right. So if you are online dating, the more options you have, the more picky you get and the less satisfied you get. And that's not just conventional wisdom. That's actually true. I mean, it that, seems true. But. That is actually true. There is a slight difference, though, between males and females. Males. Um, as the number of options increase, they just lower their threshold and just keep saying yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. As for females, the number of options go up, they actually get even more choosy. They, they somehow have a fixed number in mind. I'm only going to go on these many dates per week or date these many men in this much amount of time. So they just get even more stricter. So picky means what? Picky means less literally likely. how many you pick or less likely to be happy with your choices? Well, when I used the word picky a few minutes ago, I meant literally how many you will pick. Um, however, we also know that as the number of choices uh, go up, you are less satisfied with, on average, every option you choose. Um, so now your question is, how do I create choices? Mm -hmm. I do think we live in a world where we have a lot of choice and we have a lot of information. So we, we just talked about, so like for example, online dating, there's a billion swipes every day on Tinder. You have um, 2,500 different online dating sites now just in the United States, over 5,000 worldwide. Um, and that's just dating. 
So I, I don't, I'm sure you guys can, I could do a whole thing on all the domains in which we have more choice. In terms of more information, uh, it is currently estimated that the amount of information coming at us subconsciously and consciously per day for people living in a developed country is the equivalent of reading 174 newspapers. So we do actually have a lot of choice and a lot of information. And so I do not think that this kind of choice and information, while it does give you a lot of options, I don't think that's what's empowering. Um, because most of those, there's several problems going on. First of all, we, we can't tell them apart. So if we can't tell them apart, how are we going to make a meaningful choice? Second. What do you mean by that? We can't tell them apart. So we're all, we've become like the East Germans and the Coke Pepsi Mountain Dew. It's just we're flooded, and so we can't see the, distinct, the distinctions aren't meaningful. Hey, anyone here ever like, try to pick paint for your house? <laughs> you know, do you know the difference between super white and simple white? <laughs> if you do, please explain it to me. <laughs> You know, or when you, I mean, for those of you who are wine experts, you're going to yell at me for saying this, but I don't know the difference between all these different, what, Pinot Noirs. I mean, sure, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> and some are not good. And if you know what you're doing, then sure, there are some that are better. But most of the time, as long as it's good enough, I can't tell the difference between, you know, this minor variation of Pinot Noir versus that other minor variation. And, the, some, and apparently, even many wine experts can't tell them apart. I love that study, by the way, that I've, I've read about a lot, which is the, the blindfold wine studies, where people like yes. people who consider themselves experts literally can't tell the difference between like a $3 bottle and a $300 bottle. That is such a satisfying study. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's because she's going she's gonna to serve you wine at the dinner yes. table, which is $3, but she's going to tell you it was $300. Exactly. And you'll <laughs> believe me, that's the best part. Yeah. So I think we've come to a point, though, where we have to recognize that the real power of choice doesn't actually come from our ability to pick. So I think we've, we've for a while now, thought that the way we increase a sense of autonomy and empowerment is just by giving people more and more and more and more choice and information. The, the great French polymath Henri Poincaré once said something. I, I love this quote. He said that invention consists of avoiding the constructing of useless combinations and consists of the constructing of useful combinations, which are an infinite minority. To invent is to discern, is to choose. So I'm going to propose a corollary to you, which is to choose is to invent. And so what I'm saying there is that the real power of choice does not come from our ability to pick x over y. But more often than not, it actually comes from our ability to construct those most meaningful combinations. Can you say a little more about what you mean by, I have a visual in my head that I'm not sure is correct, yes. which is the visual is like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm in a room and I'm trying to kind of build, uh, I'm trying to build a little Lego house, but, but someone keeps giving me more and more and more and more Legos until I'm just completely overwhelmed. That's my very simplistic visualization of what you mean. But what, what do you mean about um, what you just said, the sort of. I love your visual about Legos, by the way. <laughs> that actually is one that I just recently used on my son, who's oh. 14. Uh huh, good. So um, I do think that when you are engaging in an act of meaningful creation or choice creation, it is sort of like Legos. So you look at the world, you see what kind of Lego pieces are out there. And that's helpful, because you see what tools you have to work with. But when it comes down to making that meaningful choice, now you use your own imagination. What is it that I want to make? What, what do I think would be really cool? And now we use our imagination plus both the plentitude and the constraints offered to me by the Legos to now construct a new you know, Lego masterpiece. That's how Toys R Us has a new set of masterpieces every year around Christmas. It is, but that is very helpful, because I think the moment in which we shut doors feels like a cop-out to us, that often 
and I'm you know, raised in the US, so, so, so this is probably a very American idea, but the moment when I start to artificially constrain myself, it feels like I am giving something up. It does not feel like an act of creation. So I say, look, I'm getting rid of all the Legos except the yellow ones because I can't deal with all these Legos. I'm just going to make a yellow house. It feels like you have failed in some way by, by, by making constraints. So there's some wonderful studies done uh, by anthropologists that looked at um, native uh, native populations, and they find that in those populations which have more constraints on their resources, they're, they're actually more, they're more innovative. And I use the word innovative in that I mean that they're solving their problems, right? That's what an innovation is. They're, they're not just acting in, in acts of creativity for the sake of creativity. They do that as well as in we all create music. Uh, but they're more innovative with those constraints. Um, also, the other example, if you think back to when I was talking about Joseph Priestley and the way he handled having to make that difficult choice, that was again an example where he said, no, 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 you, you cannot box me in by the pros and cons list, by choosing this or that. I'm gonna, tell, I'm gonna figure out what do I really, really want and how am I gonna make that possible? What's the meaningful choice that I can make come true? So I, I work on a podcast, and, um, and we, we, we have a longstanding debate. Uh, it's hosted by me and uh, another woman, a friend of mine, Elise Spiegel. And we have a longstanding debate where her ideology is that we should never kill any stories for creative constraint reasons, that any story that comes through the door, we have to make it work, because that will teach us how to do, how to work with creative constraints. So if the tape is not good or if the story is not working, we have to make it work. And that, that just, it's just kind of inculcates, a, a, it's a kind of way of teaching us to work within limitations. Anyway, I disagree, but, um, <laughs> but it's a good theory. Um, so um, another, uh, I'm not sure if I want to talk about, I'll give you the option, the medical options, because, because I, do, I do think it takes a long time to, um, the medical examples to pin into your head cases where keeping the door open leads to greater regret. I mean, to really explain to people why it's not always best for you to have all the choices. Um, and I think you, in your book, you talked about the French medical system versus, mm -hmm. I don't remember if it was American, it or was. even the 401k example. So both of those are good examples uh, that, which really pinned in my head why it's not always better to have infinite lots of choices. So I think the, the most, heart-wrenching decision that I ever looked at um, has been the case of the life and death choice. Uh, the first time I looked at it was with uh, French and American parents. They were in Paris versus Chicago. And all of their children, the, the newborn infants that had all been born uh, with a particular brain abnormality. Um, and so they all, all the babies were vegetables. Now, and, and there was no hope that anything more positive would emerge. The, in the case of Paris, the French doctors made the choice. And in the case of the United States, the American parents have to sign the consent form. Now, in all cases, the decision was made to end the life of the child. And, and we only looked at those cases, sometimes for religious reasons, uh, they don't, and, and that's true in both countries, uh, but we only looked at the ones where the decision was made to end the life, which was the majority of the cases, about 97%. Um, but the question we were looking at is, did the decision-making process have an effect on the parent's ability to cope with the death of their infant? And we found that it did, because we, we were able to interview and look at the interviews of these parents even up to a year after the death of their child. And the French parents had a much easier time coping with the death of their child, because they were more likely to say things like, Noah was here for so little time, but in that time he taught me so much. He, he, he taught me a new perspective on life. In the American case, you were hearing quotes like, 
I still can't believe they got me to do that. How did they get me to do that? Now I keep wondering, what if, what if? Now, in some cases, the quotes that came out of the American parents kind of reminded you of some of those really heart-wrenching um, movies like you know, Sophie's Choice. Um, and you know, what they were talking about was their death, was the death of their child. Um, so that study was done a number of years ago. And subsequently, as probably many of you know, it is still an ongoing, very difficult thing to deal with, particularly in the United States, around quantity versus quality of life decisions. Every single one of us, at some point in the next 20 years, will be making the decision of quantity versus quality of life for ourselves or for our loved one. And it's not clear, we don't know how to make that choice. Now, the question does become, does the doctor know how to make that choice? Maybe, or maybe we need a model by which we can create alignment between doctors and the family so that it's not quite as emotionally dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Because right. families literally fall apart now when you know, there, there's all kinds of diseases now, and, and the family just doesn't know how to make the choice. Um, before we open up for questions, there's another concept of yours that I would like to talk about, largely because I don't totally understand it, which is the idea of usefulness versus novelty in choices. Can you talk a little bit about that and why that's important? Usefulness versus, okay. So I am currently, uh, I developed a method, and I teach this course called Think Bigger at Columbia Business School. Um, and I'm also working on a book on this very method. But it's all about the, the concept that I talked about a few minutes ago that I alluded to when I was telling you about the Anwi Prakare quote, which is that the real power of choice comes from our ability to invent. So how do you construct a useful choice or a new meaningful choice. And I, I have been coming up with a toolkit or sort of a structured decision-making process on how we construct meaningful choices where we privilege usefulness over novelty. Now, you could argue that any time you come up with a solution to an unsolved problem, by definition, it's novel. And I don't disagree with that. However, in my method, I am not asking you to simply come up with new stuff. You know, I mean, sure, you and I could sit down and come up with a bazillion new things, lots of wild ideas. If I were to right now give you one minute if all of you were told to come up with as many wild ideas as you could and I would pull them all up, we would have a lot, at least a thousand new ideas. But that's not what I'm trying to teach people to do. I'm trying to teach people to come up with, they will be by definition novel, but really the focus is on useful. And by useful, I mean, can I give you a set of tools that assume you're biased, but it also assumes that you have the power of imagination. And so if I put together, if I pair your ability to imagine with your ability to pick and find, can I now put those two together to help you solve problems in a way that is more likely to increase your ability to generate useful solutions? And so the method privileges idea generation for only those contexts where you can say what your problem is. If you can't define your problem, then you know, shouldn't be, you, you're not, I'll tell you, you're not using my method. The first step is actually defining your problem. It's sort of like Einstein said, if I had an hour to save the planet, I would spend the first 55 understanding and defining my problem. 
So what's an example? I mean, I'm trying to think of an example maybe where people go about it in the typical way, mm -hmm. and then where you would reframe that typical way. The most common way that people solve problems, whether it's in government or it's in a company, uh, is you sit down and you say, OK, everybody, let's just get together and let's just brainstorm. What do you do when you brainstorm? You just start throwing out wild ideas, solutions, without really understanding what that problem is. Also, you're just throwing out wild ideas without any criteria for judgment. So in the method that I've been putting together, it's you define the problem. You have a criteria for judgment. You have a structured process for searching for information bits that will come to play as you start constructing or imagining that new Lego, uh, that new Lego structure that you want to create. Have you, put, have you seen this in action? I still, I'm still, it's, I want to make it one level less abstract. Like, have you seen a company do it, or have you gone through it in some way that really illustrated sort of how it works? Uh, yeah, so I actually, well, so it's a, this is a, it's actually a, a full semester course that I actually put people through, or companies I put them through for about a week. Uh -huh. But essentially, you, let's say you're walking into a, um, Let's say, let's take a, uh, an example that everybody can sort of relate to. I don't want to touch Brexit. That's too big. <laughs> um, let's say you wanted to take up the problem of gun violence. Mm -hmm. right? In the United States, we now have these random people that have guns, and they just walk into random public places, and they just start shooting. Okay? So first, what's the problem I want to solve? Well, I want to solve the problem of um, trying to make people feel safer when they go to Walmart. Okay, let's imagine you're Walmart. You want to make people feel safer. Why don't people feel safe right now? Because they don't know who might be carrying a gun. And so therefore, they don't know if they don't know who might be carrying a gun. That's one part of the problem. They don't know who, um, who might be likely to pull out their gun if they have a gun, et cetera. So I can break that down into several bits. How am I going to? search for the ways to solve that problem. I'm not going to just look around and say, oh, what are people doing? And what are all the policies and solutions that people are saying we should do? You're going to first look back in time. There have been lots of times in history where you were surrounded by other people that you know, could kill you any second, that we lived in pretty violent times, and everybody was carrying around you know, armor or guns, depending on the point in history, what did they do? How did they solve this problem? And so, for example, if you were to do that search, you would find that the history behind the reason why we shake hands with the right hand is because when people had very heavy armor, the way to show that I wasn't here to, you know, kill you um, was to shake my hand, to say, look, you can trust me. Now, I'm not saying that we, you know, we per se, um, change the way people shake hands today. What I'm saying is that's an interesting precedent. And once we see the way they applied that, is there a new way of applying things like that in a new way given the modern context? And that's how you innovate. Hmm. OK. Is that less abstract? Yes, although that feels not, I'm still try, trying to get the difference between novel and useful. Sort of that feels not, what you just did feels like a novel, a no, like a novel approach to a problem. All right, let me give you another one that's okay. very. Uh, so let's think of Netflix. Anyone here know the story of Netflix? All right. All right. So what's your name? Who knows the story? <laughs> Lauren. All right, Lauren. I won't put you on the spot, but you can. All right. So. It's a guy, he didn't return the movie at Blockbuster. I'm, I'm telling the folkloric version of the story. So didn't return the movie in time, had to pay a huge amount of money, uh, trying to figure out how to hide it from his wife. Somehow he's mad about this because Blockbuster is going <laughs> to cause a fight between him and his wife. He goes to the gym. What does he notice? Oh, they have a membership fee. 
What does he also notice? Increasingly, he's ordering books from a something called Amazon. What's the problem? I don't want to pay this this grand fee every day I'm late in returning a movie. Why can't they make this a lot easier for me? Why can't, I, why can't I just watch movies and return movies whenever I feel like it? So what are the potential pieces I can bring together to solve my problem? If we can put uh, books online, can we put movies online? Um, can we do a membership fee just like Jim's? And if I mail you a movie, will it survive? So that was the part he had to test. And I don't know if you remember, but the original version of Netflix was you, were, you, you got your movies in the mail. So you have to solve a problem. You have to look at the examples as how other people solved the pieces of the problem that you can now combine together to solve your bigger problem in a new way. I see. So you're not always looking for some new thing that nobody ever thought of. You're just trying to hone in on what is the actual In fact, problem. I don't want you to look for things that other people haven't thought of. Will that be the outcome of what you come up with? Yes. I actually think you do generate, and we do have studies that show that on average, the ideas that you generate by doing it this way are higher quality than if you just sit around coming up with wild ideas. Because wild ideas either gets you conformist ideas because you subconsciously uh, generate things that you already have a reference point to, you're, you have a bias towards it. Um, whereas if I zero in your brain on looking at how other people have solved it, I'm actually going to ch change your anchor and make it more diversified. All right, I think I understand now. So the point is, like, you shouldn't go into a meeting and just want to look smart. I see what you mean by novel. There's just a sort of bias towards, I'm going to come up with the next touch screen. I'm going to come up with something amazing that nobody ever thought of, whereas actually what you want to do is hone in on the problem, see how it's been solved before, and just be very kind of specific and methodical about it. Yes. Yes. OK, 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 I understand. Yes, questions. We have. No questions? Oh, I thought we don't have time for questions. Oh, I thought when you meant minutes, we were, that was minutes to questions. Oh, well, that's a bummer. I hope that uh, <laughs> I'm making the choice right now to give you guys no choice about your questions. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. I thought that we had a few minutes to open for questions, but uh, we talked too much, so I apologize for that. But thank you all for coming, and thank you, Sheena, for writing such an interesting book. Uh, I encourage you all to read it. It is very life-changing and will help you in many ways. <laughs> apologies. Sheena.